things that you have done and we worship you tonight we glorify with a soul of praise from our heart
we give thanks, hallelujah, hallelujah. at Glad Tidings Church, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. There is a place in our heart, in the leadership, and in the people to lift his name up. The ark of God was taken, those crazy Philistines. What's a Philistine? Well, often they're board members at churches. They're crazy. Some crazy <laughs> worship leader who's got silly things on the side, and it just steals the presence of God. Oh, but we invite you, Lord. Yes, we, love you, Jesus. we have so much yes. to thank you for. Yes. Hallelujah. Well, welcome to Glad Tidings Bible School. This is the last Monday night. Wow, it went so fast. It was, how incredible was it? Well, you know, I was thinking today about all the different um, speakers and what I've learned. And I just really was appreciative of all of the insights that I received these last eight weeks. Yeah. Well, we are the senior pastors, so I guess we get the vote here. <laughs> so we're going to vote for our favorite. Okay. And our very favorite, no ifs, ands, yeah, about. hands up. Pastor Kay Gordon. Oh, Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. She's our on the um, Mount of Olives. Yeah. It was tremendous. Uh, amazing. I got Hallelujah. so many great insights. Yeah. I thought about the arrows, too, and how they were sharpened. Right. I've sure had a lot of them shot at me. <laughs> Glory to God. I, just take with me right now. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a but few of those. we're supposed to be the sharp arrow. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've got to I've got to do a little bit of business communication with you. Uh, obviously, it's filling up quickly for the midweek and on Sunday. I mean, people want to be in the house of the Lord. But let's do something. I like those those shields. I think the shields are cool. Like you kind of look a little bit like you want to fight. Uh, uh, you you, you look clear, a little bit like like you're welding. And <laughs> yeah. You, yeah, they do I, look I, like I, a welding shield. I think shield. They're, really, okay. they're, yeah. really, they're really cool. I like them. But the government said don't wear them. So we got to wear these right here they just told us so if you don't have one we've got them at the door when you come in and we'll hand you so when you come wednesday night and on sunday we got a mask up and For there's safety. three real reasons number one it honors the seniors if you do statistics the people who have died are older and so we want to protect we've got a lot of great grandmas and grandpas godly people here and as we get older you're not a senior in your 60s anymore or your 70s. We'll just say that right yeah, now because no, we're getting we, a little we older. We changed the mark. We, we did change the yeah. mark. So let's wear the mask. Uh, let's honor the seniors. Let's honor God's house. Mm -hmm. And let's just honor our government. Uh, we're, 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 we're just thrilled that we can gather again. We're Hallelujah. respecting authority. We are. And then also, we're going to be right here for all of our family online. So don't worry about it. We're going to be online bringing the wonderful news of Jesus. Now this Sunday, and I don't want to get off track too far, but this Sunday is Mission Sunday. Someone say Uganda. Uganda. We're going to give to Uganda. And then we have a over-the-top piano organ duet. You are going to, you're going to comb your hair different. <laughs> All right? It's going to be so good. So we're looking forward a to it. A great blessing. A very great blessing. We, we want to say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to lead. I felt a great impression that we needed this Bible school. We needed to get back into the Word of God and bring the great teachers, prophets, psalmists, just to bring the Word to you. And I would give this year an A+. Plus. Me too. And I'm a hard grader. Uh, I'd give it an A+. Plus. It's just been incredible. This is our 24th week. Hallelujah. We're going to start back up in October. We'll have a whole new set of teachings and teachers uh, you're going to enjoy it we'll communicate with you but this has been a banner year i thought you know we'd just be meeting together i never imagined this bible school would go across canada mm -hmm. across the world to those poor souls in the usa 
<laughs> Hallelujah. Many of you, you know, you're, you're following us now. We, we, we tried to ditch you when we came over the border. You He's keep coming after us. just kidding. <laughs> I am kidding you. We've got people in Hong Kong. We got people in Dubai. We got people in Pakistan, India, Uganda, Liberia, uh, all over Taiwan. This has been our, our brothers and sisters in the great North Arctic. Hallelujah. We welcome you. We love you. We just had so many of you just come back to this. Did you know that Pastor Kay Gordon went to this Bible school? Pastor Dave Hubert went to this Bible school. That's pretty amazing. And it's really fun to, to talk to them about some of the history. And I just want to say this. There's hope for you because <laughs> Pastor Gordon wasn't the Pastor Gordon back then. And Pastor Hubert, that stinker, come on, help me, everybody, <laughs> that God has done a process of continually yeah. them submitting to the Word of God. And who would imagine this prophet of God would prophesy literally to 100,000 people and change the course of people's lives and churches? Who would imagine that just a, a little girl in church, enthusiastic, would preach God would use her literally to melt the hardness mm. of the hearts and people would come. And some of the greatest Christians in Canada are our brothers and sisters in the North Arctic. They love God. They worship God. And uh, it's just been exciting to see. It starts a little bit at a time. True. Just one day at a time. Mm -hmm. Just every time the house of God is open, you need to come. Because God takes ordinary people and he does extraordinary things Vince and Jody Ann shot truly were never seen as to be anything to do anything there was nothing really special about us oh but we loved him we loved his house and we loved his people and we just kept showing up and I guess finally they said, what are we going to do with this couple? We got to do something. But we just kept showing up. I wasn't the most gifted, the most talented. Jody Ann has many more talents than me. But we kept showing up in his presence. We kept showing up under his word. That's right. And God uses his word in yes. submitted lives. Yeah. He does. He uses his word. We want to take just a moment and we want to pray in faith. We want to pray in faith that God moves by the language of faith. So we're going to make a couple declarations and we're going to ask you to join with us and don't hope. Take the spiritual rabbit foot out of your pocket and believe God's word to be true. It is true. Hallelujah. So tonight we declare, Father, we thank you that you will give people peace that surpasses all understanding you're the god that gives peace and i declare the peace of the prince of peace would be on the minds and the hearts of the people uh be troubled not fear not don't live in a place of 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 hopelessness and despair but come into the kingdom of god and the god of all peace will surround your heart and comfort you in the name of jesus go ahead jody Ann. Father, we just thank you that you are the God, our healer. Yes. And that you will Even now. heal right now. Yes. Father, the people, they're, they're feeling a quickening in their hearts. And they're wondering, could it be me? I say, yes, it is Did in you? Jesus' name. Yes. The Father that heals, he healeth thee. We claim that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God, you're Jehovah Jireh. You're the God that provides. You find a way where there wasn't a way. You bring streams into the desert. I declare the provision of the children of the Most High God. Father, I thank you. Anything that's been withheld from them, blocked by them, we break it tonight right. in the name of I Jesus. And we declare that your needs are met. Your financial needs are met because we serve the God that owns everything. Father, we thank you right now. We don't come weakness. We don't come in confusion. We don't come in doubt. We come in faith. Every need is met. Miracle provision in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. And we declare bondage is broken. Yes. 
those little things, those little thoughts that have taken uh, root in your soul and in your emotions, those things that fester and cause you to be insecure and cause you to think that everybody's against you, the um, bondages that you have opened doors to, um, addictions in Hallelujah. Jesus' name. We, we pray for every kind of addiction, whether it is emotional addiction all the way down to yes. um, a chemical addiction, right. wrong um, addiction with your body we yes, break Jesus those name. in Jesus name we Hallelujah. plead the blood of Jesus yes. on you in yes. Jesus name father right now for guilt and shame be gone Amen. you are the scapegoat you take our guilt and walk it into the desert Thank you, God. Thank we don't have to carry it Thank you, Jesus. Jesus said to the most guilty woman caught in the very act neither do I condemn you and I come against the accusations have you fallen we all have have you made mistakes we all have have you rebelled we all have but that guilt and shame shall not be on you in the name of Jesus we declare off you by the blood of the lamb in Jesus wonderful name tonight and we declare that all of your sin is forgiven in Jesus, Jesus name blood. and I call forth the gift of repentance Hallelujah. father I declare Shut that there is an opening Jesus. there is a, a way oh, that there is a peace on yes. the people people that are sinning and they know that they're sinning right. and they think they can't break it I declare in right Jesus now name. the gift of repentance right. over everyone that is Hallelujah. watching right now whatever sin that you're doing Stop it in the name of Jesus. God. Whatever sin that you're doing, Power plead Christ. the blood of Jesus over your life. Turn around, go the other way, get rid of it, throw yeah. it away. Anything that draws you back, shut the door yeah. in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Well, tonight we have a true gift. And I say this boldly. He who has an ear, <laughs> let him hear. Let him hear. Don't allow your ears to just be big hunks of flesh on the side of your head. Oh. Listen, listen, listen with your heart, listen with your life, listen with your will. Let Pastor Gordon come and bring the word of God tonight. We welcome our favorite, your favorite, Pastor Kay Gordon. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Sean. And what a delight it is to be with you once again in Bible school. I, too, have really appreciated this time, and I've learned a lot. My, I, you know, we never stop learning. And when we hear different ones that minister God's Word and, and bring out new things and, and old things that we not thought about and all these things, it's a wonderful thing because there's joy in knowing the Word of God, and there's that peace, and faith in God rises. Oh, it's so good. And so I want to say thank you, Pastor, for the privilege of, of uh, ministering some in this Bible school. And we, we really believe God is doing a work today, and it's a pleasure to be a small part of it. Praise the Lord. Well, to you all, you students out there, we say congrats. You have made it. Hallelujah. Uh, all the way through from October to the end, to the 1st of June. Wow. And, you know, I want to encourage you to uh, use your time now to uh, study some of the things that really impressed your heart and things that ministered to you and uh, let them know that uh, let God know that you're ready for all that God has for you hallelujah and um, I just look uh, look back a bit and remember the days in Bible school myself and you know I came into Bible school knowing nothing nothing about the things of God uh, from an unsaved home and God was so good to me to let me go to Bible school when I was just a teenager and learn so many things 
and then I learned how much there was to learn. It's, it's on and on and on. So I encourage you and, you know, make plans for the next sessions. You're going to enjoy it, and you're going to find that God ministers to your life through the word of the Lord. Praise God. Well, it's a, a delight to look into the Word of God tonight for a few minutes. And we're going to, well, I'm going to put it this way. You know, in Bible school, I started thinking about uh, some of the things that we have learned in this past six, seven, eight, nine months. And uh, really, so many promises of God and the truths of God. Um, and there was, uh, let's just think of a few there was prayer, there were the, the wells that were being dug, remember those wells? Uh, the, the well of praise and worship, the well of missions, Holy Spirit, uh, praying in tongues. You know, that's something that uh, even our Pentecostal friends will always want to keep and to hold on to because it was the gift of God to them. And then there was the prophetic. Oh, it's so good to hear the prophetic again in the house of God. And people are ministered to by the prophetic anointing of God upon uh, our pastor. And God has used him in that realm for many years. And it's amazing what the Lord does. And we've seen that well being dug out, and we've, we learned about that. And, oh, there was teaching on the anointing, the fire of God, and many, many other things. And so, praise the Lord. We want all of these not only to be taught and for us to uh, hear, but we want them in our lives. We want to take them and make them our possession. And, you, and you, you'll find it'll change your life. And it'll cause you to have more of God than you ever thought possible. And all, all the good things that God has ordained for this time. Hallelujah. So I want to talk tonight uh, for a little bit uh, about Caleb. And Caleb was a man that didn't stop until he had received the promise. Hallelujah. And that's what we need in these last days. We need to have uh, uh, faith in God and a grip and a determination to go all the way and to dare to believe that the promises of God that are in the Bible they're yours and yours and mine and all of us together then that is what God wants us to understand I think all right Obadiah Obadiah has only got one chapter and we're just going to read one verse but uh, verse 17 but on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Oh, hallelujah. Now, this was written to natural Israel, but it's also applicable to Christians because we are the spiritual people of God. And so uh, here it, it tells us three things that go together. Deliverance, holiness, and possession. And I'll tell you, God wants us to get a hold of all of that and to put it in our hearts and in our lives. And it will guide us. It will lead us. It will teach us the ways of the Lord. Praise the Lord. And, you know, we, we hear sometimes, we hear about these things in the Bible. We hear about the many promises of God. We read them. That's good, too. We read them, and maybe times at times we read them over and over again, and that's great. We probably even talk about them. We like to talk about the things of God to our friends and to people that we meet. But, you know, it's time now 
uh, to not only do all those things, but to actually possess those possessions that God has in his word, his promises, his declarations, and we need to rise up in faith and say, now I'm going to make them mine. Hallelujah. I'm going to let them live in my heart and in my life and make me more and more like the Lord Jesus and more and more the men and the women that God wants us to be in these last days. And so one of God's great possessors in the Bible is Caleb. He took his inheritance very seriously. <laughs> and he went, as soon as it was possible for him, he went and possessed the possessions that God had given him. Possessions of land, of course, at that time. And I think that he had a tremendous faith in God, and he had a great desire to be all that God wanted him to be. Now, uh, in Joshua uh, 14, we'll read a bit about uh, uh, Caleb. Um, actually, uh, in this chapter, it's the chapter where there is given the, the, the work of God and then the provision of God to not only be a hearer, but to be a receiver and a doer of the word of God. Now, Caleb was the one of the two men who did not die in the wilderness. Remember, the people uh, wouldn't believe that God could give them the victory. They couldn't believe that the things that God had ordained were going to happen for them. And God said, all right, it looks like you're going to go around and around and around the wilderness another 40 years. But there were two men that had a different message. They brought back a good report because they were not looking at the negative things. They had fixed their eyes on the promises of God and that God would surely do what he said he would do and make a way and win the victory. Well, uh, Caleb was one, Joshua was the other. Uh, they were two of the 12 uh, men that were sent out to explore the land and to uh, see how, how it was and how difficult it might be, the good things and the other things that they needed to learn. They were sent out by Moses, and only two of them brought back a good report. Uh, but the others brought back doom and gloom. And in Joshua chapter 14, we'll just read it to get the sense of this in our minds. Uh, 14 and verse uh, <clears throat> 6. Then the children of Judah came to jo Joshua in Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephana, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word. Uh, which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old then when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, but I fully, wholly followed the Lord my God. And then the last part of verse 9, that God said to him, because he had wholly followed the Lord his God, uh, there would be the inheritance to him and to his children's children. Uh, God is always the faithful one. Praise the Lord. So this was, I want you to notice a little bit here. This man was a Kenizzite. Declared that in, in verse 6. Uh, Caleb, the son of Jephana, the Kenizzite, 
said to him. And uh, the Canaanites were really a, a tribe, a nomadic tribe that traveled around in the deserts of that area. And um, it, they would be considered strangers, foreigners to the children of Israel. But you know, God had made, uh, because God is full of mercy and full of grace, he had made a provision for the strangers that would come uh, if they would forsake their idols, forsake their old way of life, and if they would walk in the, the ways that the Lord was leading the people of Israel and keep the, the, the commandments of the Lord and, and be a part of it, then they could stay and be a part of the children of Israel. And it's amazing to find out that this Kenizzite, his name was Caleb, um, he started out as a uh, Kenizzite, his family. Now, there's not much, there's very little in the Bible about how it all happened, but God said it happened, and so if he says it happened, then that's, that's good enough for me, and we believe it. And somehow this Kenizzite became not only a Kenizzite, he became of the tribe of Judah. And I'll show you that in the scripture. In uh, Numbers chapter 13, and uh, we read that in, well, first of all, I want you to notice in verse 1 or 2 that God had sent men out to spy out the land which they were giving. And then he said, one, one from each tribe of your fathers, you shall send a man from each, that's it, from each tribe of your fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. They had to be leaders of their tribes. God said it. And look who Moses chose for, from the tribe of Judah in verse 6. And from the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Oh, and he started out with a, a Kenizzite background. You see, it doesn't matter about your past. It doesn't matter what you did or where you came from. If you give yourself to the Lord, he will wash away all the past and make the changes in your life that will astound you, and he will cause you to become all that God wants you to be. So here was uh, Caleb, just a Kenizzite, just an ordinary person. And he had, now he had left all his idols and left his old life and all the traditions of the Kenizzites. And now in Numbers 16 and 3, uh, 16, 13 and 6, I'm sorry, he is of the tribe of Judah. And you know that that was the top tribe in Israel. When they were going to move on, it was the tribe of Judah that would lead them. And you know what Judah means? It means praise. Oh, hallelujah. And it was, no wonder it was chosen to be the leading tribe because, uh, because of the praises of God and the worship of God that was in that tribe. And here, Caleb is a part of it. Not only a part of it, he has become a leader in Judah. You see, you never know what God will do with a person who has a desire for the Lord in their life. I'll tell you, he can change people. He can make them anew. And 
that when we give our lives to Jesus, invite him in, that's when the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all of our sin. That's when God begins to work within us and old things pass away and all things become new. Oh, and many wonderful things begin to happen in our life. And if we're true to God and follow God as this man, Caleb, did, he said he wholly followed the Lord. It was all for God in his life. And because of that, God rewarded him with the promises of God and with an inheritance that was beautiful, not only for him, but for his family. And so you can see that somewhere in the Kenizzite uh, heart here, in uh, Caleb's heart or his family's heart, somewhere decisions had been made, choices had been made. And you know, you can, you know, we must never underestimate the power of a choice because it can make darkness into light. <laughs> it can make a sinful person into a godly man or woman of God. It can do what nothing else can do. And the blood of Jesus Christ is it's the same today. It, it works the same. It, uh, it never, never will lose its power because it was shed by Jesus himself and he died on the cross for all people, and this was one of them. And so the power of a decision. Doesn't matter what you were. Doesn't matter where you came from. If you trust God, if you give it all to Jesus, it's what you become in God that counts. And God will see that that happens in your life. So we choose to leave the old life. We choose to walk in the newness of life. And then as we serve the Lord, we also choose to follow all the way. And uh, as we serve him and let him work within us, it's amazing what he does. And this man, Caleb, became a possessor. You know, why settle for a mediocre Christian life when you can be an overcomer? Why be sat satisfied with little when God has much to give you? Hallelujah. And we need to always realize that the more we give to God, that makes the more room within us for God to pour in his good things, to, to make his promises, his word alive to us, to let his Holy Spirit fill us and change us, to bring us into a new realm of peace and joy and victory in our lives. It's all possible, and God is more willing to give it than we are to receive it. And it's all available to every person because Jesus died for all and his love extends to all too. Now, this man, Caleb, was different. <laughs> you know, uh, he did not follow the crowd. He dared to be different in his generation. He took a stand and he would not compromise. He was in the world, but he was not of the world. God had worked a work in his heart. And it's the same opportunity for all of us today. Just open your heart. Open your life to the Lord. And you'll be surprised what God can do for you. Praise the Lord. Compromise is not a word for a Christian that wants to be all God wants them to be. We want to go all the way. And you know, the Bible speaks about uh, what God will work out for us uh, in 
Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. It says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. That's what Caleb had to do. He had to come out, his family, come out from the, the, the others in, in his tribe that were going to go in a different direction and just serve themselves. And he said he had to obey this, this command. And then it says, and touch not the unclean. Oh, God just wants to do such a work in us and change us from glory to glory and from strength to strength and from victory to victory until all the old stuff and the uncleanness and that which does not glorify God is gone, gone, gone. And we're filled with God's spirit, God's love, God's mercy, and all the good things of God. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. There it is. It's applicable to whosoever will. Whosoever will may come, the Bible says, and whosoever will may receive from the Lord. And he said, I'll be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Almighty. But I'll tell you, there's no room for compromise, but it is a total submission and a total dedication to God that really, really counts. And I think about the three Hebrew children in the book of Daniel. Remember, uh, they wouldn't bow and worship the idol, uh, the, the, the big statue that the king had made. And they said, no, we will not bow down and worship, worship it because we worship the Lord God. And those three young men were thrown into a fiery furnace. And it was made seven times hotter, the Bible says, than usual because the king was so enraged that these three young men would not bow down to the idol and, to the, and worship what he had made. And uh, they went into the fire all right. But, you know, they watched it from afar, and even the king watched it. And they said, hey, didn't we throw three men in? Well, I see four of them, and the fourth one is like unto the Son of God. And there in the middle of the fiery furnace, Jesus came to them. And you know what? The Bible tells us they came out of that fiery furnace perfectly well. And they came out with, e with not even the smell of smoke on their garments. Oh, what a deliverance. God showed his power to them because they would not compromise. And <clears throat> I believe this is a day that we need to, to make that kind of a commitment to God. We will not compromise. We want to go all the way with God. And so we need to take a stand. And you know, really, one of the qualities of the last day church of Jesus Christ is radical. Take a stand for God and not crumble. It'll take some on fire spirit filled radical people, Christians, to reach this, this radical generation. But God will do it and who knows God may choose you or you or you to be one of those that are spirit-filled, radical Christians to bring a deliverance to many that stand in need. <clears throat> but, and, you know, with those three Hebrew children, well, young men, when they were in the fiery furnace, they wouldn't bow, and God would not let them burn. And I say today, 
if we stand tall and strong for God in our generation and do what is right in the sight of the Lord and let the Holy Spirit fill our lives so out of it comes the, the peace and the joy and the victory that people are looking for, then we will learn the same truth. If we don't bow, God won't let us burn. Well, that was... Uh, how Caleb looked at things. And um, he was a man of faith and action. And you know, faith must have action to it. It says faith without works, without action, is dead. But oh, living faith in God, when we put in action to it, we pray believing. And <clears throat> even if we don't see the answer immediately, we praise believing. We trust believing. We stand on the word of the Lord believing. That's putting action to our faith. And that will lead us on in the things of God. And also in, uh, I think it's Numbers, yes. Numbers 24 uh, is a, another scripture that God uh, gave that uh, about this man numbers 24 and it talks about the, the other spies they they didn't have a good word to say they were just full of doubts and and negativity but not uh, not the two the two men that believed God and uh, and of course one of them being Caleb. <clears throat> and in, in that uh, chapter, it tells us uh, how he was going to stand up for God. And uh, it said, but Caleb had another spirit. He wasn't like the others. They were humanistic. And because of that, they were exhibiting a humanistic thinking, doom and gloom. Oh, they said, look, <clears throat> we've been in the land of promise, in the, uh, the promised land that you're looking forward to. And they said, oh, uh, it, it's, it's, there's giants there. There's big difficulties there. And, it be, and those giants and those difficulties became impossibilities to them. But Caleb had another spirit. Uh, he had the spirit of faith and confidence, and he spoke faith. He demonstrated his faith by the words of his mouth. And it tells us in uh, Corinthians, I think it is, yes, 2 Corinthians 4.13, we believe and therefore speak. You know, some people think, oh, I want to keep everything deep in my heart. Well, it's good to have it in your heart, all right. But the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Hallelujah. And so we want to be speaking faith. And it does tell us in Romans 10, 8, that the word of faith is in our mouth and in our heart. And I, th I believe, I have learned through experience to dare to speak faith when you don't see everything working together perfectly. And you speak faith over situations. You, you pray in faith. You praise in faith. You believe God in faith. Oh, I'll tell you, and soon you'll see things begin to turn. Things begin to work out. And you'll know that God is still completely and totally in control. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, there's another verse about Caleb there. Deuteronomy 1 and verse 36. First, uh, first of all, in 35, the Lord said, That surely not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land of which I swore to give your fathers. And then he goes on, Except 
Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. He shall see it, and to him and his children I'm giving the land on which he walked because he wholly followed the Lord. Hallelujah. And that's, that's how our God is. When we uh, wholly follow God with all our heart and our soul and our put our mind to it and everything that we do, we say, Lord, your will be done, your purpose be made known, uh, you'll discover that he will open the blessings of God upon you. And this is what was promised to Caleb. Uh, not because he was a great man, not because uh, he was a converted Kenizzite even. It was because he wholly followed the Lord. And you know, God looks for each one of us in our own lives to make those kind of commitments. And when we do, it opens the blessings of God and we will not only read and rejoice in the many promises of God, but we'll begin to take them and receive them and put them in our hearts and in our lives. And they'll begin to grow and the good things of God will surely come to pass. Now, one thing about Caleb, he understood the timing of God. You know, God says to every purpose under heaven, he has a time and a season. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 1. And Caleb heard the message that because of all the others that would not believe the good report, that they were going to stay in the wilderness uh, another 40 years and go round and round and round and round. Caleb didn't give up because he knew that God had a time to fulfill his promises. He knew that when God said, you're going to have an inheritance, he was going to get it. And so what did he do? He used the time to keep himself strong. Now, you know, he was 85 when, when the, the, the real time came for him to receive his promise. And so for the preceding 45 years, he stayed strong. That tells me he just wasn't loafing. He was busy. He was working. He was, I bet you he flexed those muscles, oh boy. Uh, and he did everything he could do to get himself ready because he knew God always keeps his promise and that he would come uh, and he would cause uh, all these good things to begin to happen. Now, he was also a man of vision. He'd been spying the land for 40 days. He'd eaten of the grapes and, and all those things. And he said, we're going to have it. It's going to be ours. And his faith never, never dimmed. And then he watched and he waited. And one day he saw them all going down to the River Jordan. And he knew that was a signal that the victory was just around the corner. And so he stood uh, before Joshua in Joshua 14, 10, and he said, I am alive and strong, ready for war. And he went on and said, give me this mountain. Now, this was uh, Mount Hebron, and he said, give me this mountain. It was, it was full of giants. But that didn't phase this man at all. He said he knew God would give it to him. And he had to take the mountain first, and then he could take the city. And you know, sometimes we've got to take mountains first. Maybe it's a mountain of doubt, a mountain of, of uh, fear, 
Oh, all kinds of things. And we got to say, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to take that mountain out. It's not going to be in my life, in my thinking, in my words. I'm going to have victory. And you know, if you ask for the mountain and you believe it, God will do it. And he did it for uh, this man, Caleb. And he took the mountain. Imagine fighting all the way and going up a mountain at the same time. And they were all giants, big, big, big men. But with flashing eyes and a strong voice, Caleb declared, I'll drive them out if the Lord is with me. And he did it. And Hebron was once the city of the ruling giants. And it became the city where King David later reigned for seven years. But you know, that's, that was wonderful. But Caleb didn't stop there. He went on and he helped others take their, their inheritance too. He helped them get the victory. And I believe that God is raising up Caleb's in this hour that will dare to believe, dare to stand on the promises of God, dare to remind God of what he has said and what he would do, and they believe God, and it's going to come to pass a big, big victory. But we got to rise up in faith in this hour, and we got to let the Lord know that we are in it to win it. Hallelujah. Now, we're not quitters. We're not going to stop. We're going to go all the way, and God is going to move in a mighty and a powerful way and let the promises of God be possessions to the believers that go for it. And so I want to encourage you, uh, wonderful to know the promises, but, oh, don't stop there by faith in God and by trusting in his word and by reminding God of his promises, you can, you can be an overcomer and you can possess your possessions in God because this is an hour and this is a time that there shall be deliverance and there shall be a wonderful time in God's presence and there shall be possessors of the great things of God. And I, I do want to encourage you students, stay in the word. Live in the word. Let your faith go to God. Dare to believe. And you will be amazed what God can do with your life and the joy and the victory that comes. It's well worth it. Let's go all the way for God in our day. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Well, I believe that was a really good word that Pastor Kay said that we should um, take what we've learned this last few Bible schools and just study it. And I think that it would be a good idea to look up some of those promises and start claiming them because God does want us to be possessors. What a great word. Boy, what a treasure she is. Well, Pastor Schott's going to come in just a moment, but we're going to take a break right here, and we're going to take the offering. Um, and so you can do e-transfer. You can go online. You can drop it in the mail, or you can drive by. Uh, 3456 Frazier Street, and we have a mailbox, a uh, mail slot on the side of the building, and you can just drop it in there. And we just encourage you that you would ask God what you should do, what you should sow into Bible school. I have a verse I'm going to read to you, Deuteronomy 431. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon or destroy you, or forget the covenant with your ancestors, which he confirmed to them by oath. Jesus loves us so much. Isn't that great? That is such an encouraging word. He's never going to leave us. He's always merciful to us. No matter what happens, he's always merciful. So right now, Pastor Schott's going to come and give us a great word on generals. 
Pastor. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Jody Ann. Did you enjoy Pastor Kay Gordon, everybody? Hallelujah. What a wonderful woman of God. And she has possessed multiple lands. And what she says, she's lived and it works. Well, we're going to go to a whole nother level. This is the last session of our Bible school this year. And I'm just going to take us way up there right now. This is not for the weak. This is not for the backslider. This is for leaders right now. And Bible school is training leaders. Now, Father, we thank you for this word. You have generals in the kingdom of God. We recognize them. And Father, we want that authority that you put on man, Father, to come on my life. I could not have done what I've done without the generals you brought my way. And I thank you right now in the name of Jesus for generals. I pray your people would discern and recognize them. And Father, that authority of the kingdom of God that you entrusted to them would be used in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, looking at Ephesians chapter 4. Now tonight will be a little bit strong, but I think we've had too many chocolate sundaes and candy bars. I think we need the real thing. Are you ready for the real thing tonight? I say we need the real thing. And he gave some as apostles. This isn't the word of God. He gave some as apostles. Interesting place in Melody Land, it was called, in Anaheim, California. There was a Midwest, a little bit country boy. Uh, his name was Ralph Wilkerson, Pastor Ralph Wilkerson. And he had faith. Here's a country boy. He didn't dress right yet. You know, he, he's not cool. You know, he's, he, he's from, the, from the south. But God told him to go there. And he was a general. And there was a dance hall right next to Disneyland. It was called Melody Land. And the Lord said to this general, possess it. And out of this house, I will send ministers around the world. Well, he didn't have any money. But God put an anointing of a general. And wouldn't you know it, that dance hall, and it sat about 4,000 people, it got in financial trouble. They began to sue each other. And so Disneyland thought about buying it, but he slipped in with the prophetic word from God and bought that place. Now, that's not what I'm sharing. Listen to me. Out of Pastor Wilkerson, three incredible men of God's prophetic voices were birthed because of their connection with Ralph, Ralph Wilkerson. One of them, phenomenal prophet of God, a great man of God, his name is Pastor Tim Bagwell. Pastor Tim Bagwell has one of the clearest prophetic voices that I have heard. He's an incredible man of God. But Pastor Wilkerson would have him preach there, revival meetings, and he caught something submitting to the man of God. And God, because of that general, that apostle, laying hands on him, he became a powerful prophetic voice. Let me go to another one. Many of you know this name, Tim Story. Tim Story God's used in words of knowledge, words of wisdom like no man I've heard. Signs and wonders. What happened? He was a young man. His sister got saved, went to the church. He went there and committed his life. And he was under Ralph Wilkerson. And he was sent to millions of people from where? Melody Land and a general. Let me give you a third one. Now you're going to know this one. This guy has ability to dialogue and have a prophetic voice to the nation. And his name is Mario Murillo. Mario Murillo is a tremendous prophetic voice, even politically. These three men got under the anointing of a general, and they simply would have been just good preachers with good ideas, but they became voices to the nation and to the nations because what? And God, look what it says, gave some to be apostles. The apostle or a general will put someone in the place God designs for them. Most people will miss their assignment without that apostolic anointing. And I don't know why God talks to them that way. I don't know why God put that thing on it, but he said, I gave some, listen, to be apostles. The number one responsibility of an apostle 
is to be a father who places, places people in their divine assignment. You better hear this tonight. He gave. Look what it said in Exodus chapter 2 in verse 14. Now this isn't the best scripture, and I, I wouldn't have it tattooed on you. This is crazy what went down. You can have a what I call a familiar spirit with an apostle, and you'll miss out for the greatest blessing God has for your life. You can get a familiar spirit. You say, well, I know them, and I know who they are, and I know how they preach. And I'm telling you tonight, you can miss God. Here's what it says, Exodus 2, 14. Who made you a prince and judge over us? Huh. Here's two slaves, Hebrew slaves. And here is a literally a prophet of the Most High God that doesn't know he's going to be a prophet of the Most High God. Here he is trying to defend them and save their life. And they turn around and turn on him. He was delivering them from the bondage. And they prophetically said to him, to Moses, who made you? Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Then they got even mouthier. You're going to kill us like you did that Egyptian. I believe their deliverance was in danger. I believe it. I believe my deliverance was in danger when I was a young man, when God brought generals into my life. Just because my church was growing, just because it was large, just because I'm on television, I, as a young man, still needed apostolic covering. I still needed a voice to say to me, you're nothing. You can be wiped out in a second. I needed it. We'll see all through history. Now, there's two sides to it. I'm going to give you, I believe that we're going to see the greatest demise of preachers we've ever seen on the planet. I believe with everything in me. I believe right now God is removing preachers. Right this moment. I believe, preacher, if you're immoral, you're done. You're done. It's over. You can cry, you can throw yourself on the ground, you can be sorry, you can feel really bad about it. Go sell used cars. See, there's no fear of God anymore. Preachers think they can live like they want to live, eat what they want to eat, do what they want to do, and there's no God. I'm going to show you in the Word of God tonight. This won't be good. If you're a preacher and you don't want to hear this, this is a good time to just tune it out right now. Zechariah 11:17. it says this, Woe to the worthless shepherds. <laughs> Woe! <laughs> that word is power. Whoa, you're going to be wiped out. Preacher, listen to me. Missionary, listen to me. If you're involved in pornography, get rid of it tonight. Run to your mate and say you've sinned, and maybe God will spare you. Huh. You see, preachers are afraid of people. Pulpits are afraid to tell the truth. And so now what we have is we have what's called a shipwrecked church. They're immoral. They steal. They don't have a hunger for God. And we're in big trouble. I've never heard of more immorality and foolishness than right now. And I'm telling you, God says those preachers that behave like that, he calls them worthless. <laughs> now those are fight words. God himself calls them worthless. Now go with me to Ezekiel 34. And the word, verse 1, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds. I know every preacher wants the word. God's going to expand your ministry. He's going to promote you. You're going to be on national television. Come on, somebody. Oh, but God says prophesy what? against him. 
if you are a general, there are no margins for you. Huh? There's no margins. For the body, there's margins, there's grace. But if uh, you aspire to the office of overseer, you must be above. You must live different. It's not about your retirement. It's not about your parking spot. It's not about your position. It's not about your title. It's about him putting him. He is the shepherd. He is the king. We're not. He says this, prophesy against the shepherd. I'm so excited about doing a pastor's conference. I know you'll want to come. Who feed themselves. Should they not feed the flock? They clothe themselves, but they don't feed the flock. They don't care about the weak. They don't go to heal people and services and with their words or bind them up and bring them back, seek after them. But when force and cruelty, you've ruled them. Jody Ann and I are just shocked how cruel some preachers can be. Just cruel. Controlling and mean and nobody matters. Nothing matters. Oh, by the way, sheep, don't get too relaxed right now because we're coming your way in a few moments. Hallelujah. You did, yeah, this man of God, I, I want my pastor to hear this. Oh, your pastor's going to want you to hear the whole counsel of God. You're going to see pastors be wiped out. You're going to see some of them die. Their ministry's taken away because the ministry they had never belonged to them in the first place. It was God's. There was a broken preacher. He had a sanctuary that seated 600 people, and he had 100 of the most legalistic, mean, nasty people on the West Coast. He was heart sick. He loved God. But all they did was operate in legalism. All they did is have rules. And all they did is fight about nothing. And he'd sneak up to this church, drive four hours after a Sunday morning meeting to get out of this stupid church and out of his stupid town. And he'd drive to this little church that was on fire. And he would weep. And he would see God's presence. And this man of God said to him, you can start over. And God can use you. That preacher that quit a thousand times was named Pastor Dick Iverson. And he drove up to Vancouver, British Columbia, to a church called Glad Tidings. And the man of God, the apostle, you see, Pastor Iverson was still young, finding his way, but an apostle came into his life. And this apostle named Pastor Reg Lizelle saved his life. See, there wouldn't have been a Frank DiMaggio. There wouldn't have been a Wendell Smith. And many of you other great ministers without Pastor Reg Lizelle, a prophet and an apostle, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know we put on our brakes and we don't want to hear this, but what could you be if you had the proper apostolic covering? A relationship. Any true apostle that wants to control you is becoming cultish. You don't want to control somebody. You want to help somebody. And sometimes you help them by slapping them down. That's part of the process. You don't want to control somebody. It goes on to say here in the Word of God, they have scattered because there was no shepherd. Just because you preach in a pulpit doesn't mean you're a pastor. Scattered. They became game or food for animals, for beasts. Then God just goes off on us. This pertains to me too. The fear of God comes on me too. Everybody wants to talk about God's going to use me. If he doesn't kill you first, watch. 
Ezekiel 34, 10. I'm against the shepherds. Oh. Now, I've had some things against me. But one thing I don't want against me is God himself. Since it's his church, I don't want him. I'm against you. And some of you are walking into your churches, and God himself is against you. He's against your pride. He's against your arrogance. He's against your control. He's against your manipulation. He's against you always selling yourself that you're the great man of God. God is against it. Try to really prophesy without God. Try to see someone healed without God. It's God. He just uses us. But it's him. He's the king. And it says this, that God says, I'm against the shepherds. Wow. Isn't this fun scripture? And then he says this, I'm going to remove him. Ezekiel 34, 2 through 10. Well, they have to vote me out first, and I have a lot of people for me. Oh, God has the final vote. And you're going to see shepherds, they haven't cared about the people. They only care about their ministry. They're ambitious to be famous. I'm going to just say this. The anointing and the call on glad tidings is too big for the skill set on Vince and Jody and Chuck. It's that simple. Now, I think I'm smart, but I'm just smart enough to know what God is going to do here. He doesn't need me. He does not need me. Now, he will use me if I cooperate with him. I never want the word of God to declare prophesy against. I never want the word of God to say to me, I'm against you. Now, this is the word of God. And you're going to see pastors removed like you've never seen before. And I'm going to ask churches, stop hiring pastors. Stop it. Stop hiring someone you can control. Fast and pray and find the one that's called to honor God and to lead. To lead. Not control. Lead. And get around a real man of God. And hold his hands up. And the victory will come to the church again. I believe that we did not honor Pastor Reg Lizelle as we should have. It was a nowhere little side church in 1948 to a literally a world church in 1970, but there wasn't the honor. I believe we suffered for it. I believe that his name has not been honored in this pulpit enough times. Well, we don't want to make a shrine to him. No, we just want to honor. Well, he's not God. No, 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 no. God's God. But he gave some, <laughs> hear it? He gave some to be apostles. You know, I, 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 I'm going to be honest. I talked to Pastor Fred in Uganda. The first thing we went in my heart, he's an apostle now. He wasn't. He was just a young African in this church, kind of come and go. But today he oversees multiple churches, multiple ministries, all through Uganda and other nations. And God's put an anointing of a father. He doesn't want to be a superstar. <laughs> I can't outrun a five-year-old. I went to the children's church. I was a little bit embarrassed. Beautiful young girl, and she was playing a video game with a second grader. And I went in there, and I just smiled, and here's this lovely girl. She's working in there. She's dueling with a second grader. And I said to her, are you winning? She said, no, he's good. And this little boy with glasses looked at me and said, I'm beating her. I'm beating her. Now, I saw in her eyes, and everybody in there giggled. We wanted him to beat her. We want you to succeed. We want your family to succeed. We want your business to succeed. We want your children to succeed. We want your ministry to succeed. We want you to succeed. We need to honor. 
worthless shepherds. Zechariah eleven seventeen. Ezekiel 34, 2 through 10. Says this, God is going to remove shepherds. Now let's flip the page. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1. Look at this. Look at the Word of God. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1. Tonight is for real. Now you, you're all in real Bible school. <laughs> this is real now. We just shifted to a whole nother level. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because he married an Ethiopian woman. He married this Ethiopian woman. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? Oh, go down to verse 6. Hear my words. This is God speaking. Now, you know they're all relatives. So you know you can say stupid things to your cousin. You know, you, know, you, you can say stupid things to certain people because you all grew up together. You know, you can just kind of go off on them. But how about if God hand chose them? And do you want Joseph, your little brother? Or do you want the man of God that will save your life and bring provision in your drought that you're going to die? You have to choose. Hear now my words. Is there a prophet among you? I, the Lord, make myself known to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. It's not so with Moses. He is faithful in all my house. And I speak to him face to face. It's different. When you have apostolic in your life, there is a security and a strength and provision that will come your way that wouldn't have. It's a fact. It's a supernatural thing. And when you and I spout off our mouth, doesn't God speak to us? Yeah, he does. But I know these people, God speaks to them a little different. And you can plug into everything God has for your life. There's a whole bunch of rebellion. Nobody wants spiritual authority. Nobody wants to tell what to do. And that's why you're a mess. That's why your kids are a mess, your business is a mess, your life is a mess. Why then, verse 8, were you not afraid? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against them. Now, I'm going to be really honest with you. This is honest time. Pastor Iverson's beautiful wife died. One of the most godly women, Edie Iverson, truly a woman of God. And some time went by, and Pastor Iverson was going to remarry. And I was on the phone with a great man of God. And the man of God said, did you hear that Pastor Iverson's going to get remarried? I said, yeah, yeah, I, I heard it. And the man of God that I was talking to was older than me, and he kind of goes, God, he's kind of young, you know what? And I laughed with him. I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. And we hung up. I, I, I was sick inside. I was just sick inside. I, I didn't gossip, call everybody. I just was sick inside. And I called this wonderful man of God back up. I said, I don't feel good about that conversation. He goes, me either. I was trying to call you. And the two of us, and I'm telling you, this man of God that I was talking to is high level, way higher than mine. But even he said, I don't feel good about this. I said, me either. Both of us kind of like, oh, like the fear of God came on us. We just asked the Lord to forgive us, and we began to bless Pastor Iverson and thank God for, for God putting this thing together. It was really weird. 
I got off the phone, and the Lord said, you know, I could have been done with you. Whoa. I have never in my life, ever, ever, seen the children of parents who talk bad about the man of God and the house of God, their children make it. Ever. Not one time. There needs to be, oh, should we go back to pastors, the worthless ones that God's going to remove? Step up now, baby, it's your turn. All of us have lost the fear and the reverence of God's generals. We've lost it. Somehow, some way, we play by a different set of rules. It says here in, in verse 9, so the anger of the Lord was against them. And I find this ironic. Miriam's mad that he married a black girl, but it says that she became leprous. If you like white, here's some more. Here we are. Then she said a wise thing. She's sitting there with leprosy, and she said, we've acted foolishly. I've acted foolishly. I've been foolish. I've thought I'm so important, I'm surprised that the sun comes up in the morning. I am as guilty as everybody, but I've reeled myself in. I have taken my heart and said, God, I don't want to miss a thing you have for my life. So Moses, look what it says in verse 13, cried out to the Lord, saying, please heal her. Wow. I got mad at Pastor Iverson. I, I felt like he didn't defend me. Really in a very difficult time and he asked me questions and I thought he knew my heart and my character and I felt like I was on a witness stand. And I just needed help. I wasn't sinning but there were some things against me and I was young and I didn't understand the warfare. Now keep in mind he had the prophetic apostolic ability to put me in this miracle church now all of a sudden i'm smart all of a sudden i'm i got a couple thousand people and I, i'm kind of the man and and i you know I, i'm getting hit sideways by a few people and he's not running to the great v to run to my aid for a half second i thought is he for me and i just kind of hardened my heart through a little personal tantrum well i don't need him I don't need him. God's with me. I hear from God now. God's using me all over the world. I'm preaching everywhere. Just, just, just a little attitude. Just a little bit off. And about nine months went by, and I just kind of reinforced my, my feelings, my opinions. And the Lord said to me, are you done? Done with what? What did you do to get here? Huh? What did you do to get here? You were apostolically put in this place, and he can say what he wants when he wants. You need to knock it off. So I called him. I said, could you, could you come and preach here? He said, oh, you're a son. I, 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 he said, I'd love to. He came. Did phenomenal. And the Lord said to me, give him the largest offering he's ever had in his life. I said, well, Lord, we're a little short on the money in the church. We've got a lot of things. Give him the money. Give it to him. I gave him the check. Oh, no, no, no. He was more humble. He was more anointed. He was more everything than me. He just loved me. You see, when you're with a true apostle, they don't rub it in your face tell you you're dumb they want you to be reinstored reinstated and pushed into what God has for you see we got a whole bunch of control freaks and we got a lot of denominations and you can get great brochures from the denomination and I want to say in some of the denominations there's some of the greatest fathers in those denominations great men of God in every denomination but there's others just love their power and their position You see, please heal her. 
So it says this, so Miriam was shut out of the camp for seven days. Wow. To shut out. I, I never want to find myself shut out, do you? I never want to be shut out of the will of God. Now go with me to Hebrews uh, chapter 13. And uh, you'll find this very, very interesting. And I've went to the Lord in prayer, and I've got to bring this word to you today. We need real teaching now. And uh, verse 17, Hebrews chapter 13, let me get there. It's interesting. Obey those who rule over you. Be submissive. For they watch over your soul as those, as those who must give an account. Let them do it with joy and not with grief. For that would be unprofitable for you. I'm going to ask you a question, a fair question. You, what does your pastor say about you? What report does he give about you? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I served a man for four years. I could preach better than him, flow better than him, lead worship better than him, gather better than him, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He knew it. I knew it. God knew it. And I didn't care. I was there for one reason, to serve him and his vision. He was such a man of God that he wouldn't go on a vacation. He so loved the people of God, the house of God. I finally went to him. I said, Pastor, I promise you, if you go away a week, nothing will happen when you're gone. Nothing, good or bad. We will not, we will not have a move of God. We will, we will, it'll just be seamless. Nothing bad will happen, nothing good will happen. It'll just be one week where you can just rest. Well, I don't know, Pastor. I promise you, nothing good will happen, nothing bad will happen. So he decided to do it. <laughs> so we had a, board meeting, and they wanted me to come into it. I was preaching with the youth, and I came in and sat there, and they, one of them said, well, we, we need to fire the principal today. Oh, oh, Jesus. I promised him. So here I am, 27 years old. I don't know much. I got one good sermon. I still do, by the way. And here I am at this meeting, and I quickly write on this piece of paper, I, Pastor Vince Schott, have nothing to do with this firing. Here I am, a young man. And I said, oh, excuse me. Yes, Pastor. Oh, yes, yes. Could you guys all sign this real quick? And they went, what? Just sign this real quick. I need, I need you guys to sign this for me. And the first one looked at it and goes, ooh. They passed around and go, we'll wait to fire her. That'll be Pastor's decision. I went, ooh. When I went to his funeral, I'm not given to emotion. I don't cry. But when I went to the funeral, I just began sobbing. And I said to the Lord, God, thank you that you let me serve this great man of God. God, I knew so much when I came under him. But when I left him, I realized I know so little. And he knew so much. His son-in-law, great preacher, came back to the back of the church and said, Dad said that no man served him like you did. He requested that you'd sit in the front row with the family. Oh, mess me up. Just mess me up. Everybody's going to see me bawling. And I couldn't stop. And the Lord said to me, your anointing isn't your preaching and your prophecy. Your anointing is you serving great people, Vince. That's where it came from. And I began to get a revelation. There are generals in the faith. True generals in the faith. I'm going to go back to the preachers for a moment. 1 Peter 5, 2. 
it says, care, feed God's flock under your care. Look what it says. There's not one person at Glad Tidings is mine. They're God's. They're not mine. Preachers, those are not your people. You can't threaten them and control them. They belong to God Almighty. They were not bought with your blood. They were bought with the blood of the Lamb of God. So now when we get, begin to understand, there are generals. And you will be more than you ever could be if you connect with the proper generals. And generals will be demoted and wiped out if they don't do what God says. Are you with me tonight? Pastor Reg Lazell was a general. I'm not here to make a shrine to him. I'm here tonight to bring back the honor that we need to give him so God can bless this house. I want the blessing of the Lord to be on glad tidings. And we don't need to wait for it for another 40 years. We need it now. So what we have to do, we have to come back and say this man got a revelation from God. Let me, let, let me tell you what I did. I am down in Seattle doing what Glad Tidings used to do. I'm not that gifted, I'm not that talented, but I had one thing, the presence of God. The irresistible presence of the King of Kings and the awe of his presence, the prophetic, the song of the Lord. I was doing what Glad Tidings stopped doing. And we went from 400 to 2,000, supernatural, not because of Vince shot, because an apostle laid the groundwork, and what we did, we took it. We took it. Pastor Dick Iverson took it. He said, this is God. He was at Glad Tidings from 1948 to 1970. Here's some observations of what took place. Listen to it closely. All in one accord, one heart, and one mind. Would you give up what you think? I live in Canada. I don't think like a Canada, a Canadian. However, I'm switching from the NBA to the NHL. I've been finding myself just watching hockey, screaming at the, that puck, yelling when they knock someone into the glass. Like, that's cool. I like it. I have to die to what I think. I have to die to what I want. And then I have to be strong to what I know God wants. I will not have staff pouting. I will not have staff lazy. I will not have staff whispering and murmuring and gossiping because I love God's house too much to let that nonsense go on. It's not that I want my way, but I want God's way. How about you? God's anointing is on this house because what we're doing is we're putting things in order. There's no way we could give this money to missions unless the blessing of the Lord was on this house. There's no way in COVID could we have more money coming in than we're spending. It's impossible. There is no way we could have worship. We have novices, complete novices, except one, one or two. But they're novices, they're young. And the glory of the Lord is in the house again. Because why? There's generals. And if we will listen to the generals, Moses was a general. Joseph was a general. All through the word of God. And that's when the kingdom of God went forward because God has chosen some to be apostles. All in one accord, one heart, one mind. I'm going to ask you a fair question. Are you willing, I am, to give up what you want in your opinion for a revival? Are you willing to do that? Number two, praying. 
everyone old and young praying corporately in the Holy Ghost, and God will move. Everyone. Everyone. Three. Worship fervently. Singing in the Spirit. And God's heavenly choir and the angels are on entertained unnoticed where the glory of the Lord is the Lord gave him truly a revelation he believed this this was the revelation God unity revelation of the body of Christ expressed through the local church he believes that the unity the revelation of Jesus Christ would be shown in the local church. Not in special meetings, not down the road, but right in the local church. But I believe God's not being able to find people, leaders that will truly be shepherds and people that will truly be shepherd. And so we've hindered the move of God. All through Canada and the U.S., we have shows going on. We literally do, user-friendly. Everything is about seducing the people to make sure they're comfortable. I'd rather just have just a group here, whoever it might be. Oh, God, we want you. Oh, God, we'll do anything you tell us to do. Oh, God, we love your house. Oh, God, we love missions. Oh, God, we love your presence. People. That's where the revival will come from. It won't happen through tricks. It won't happen through slickness. It won't happen through a website. And I'm not telling you we shouldn't have the best sound, the best website, the best everything, but I'm telling you, unless the anointing is on it and God's pleased, and if God is saying to pastors right now, you're worthless, how, and God says in his word, I'm against them, I think we're in big trouble. What do you think? Unity. Revelation of the body of Christ expressed in the local church. Number two, prayer. My house is a house of prayer. When we talk about prayer, it's Holy Ghost prayer. It's different. Let me give you a few scriptures. And the last one probably is the foundation. A house of worship. A house of real worship. Hebrews 13.1. Let us bring the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. Just come into God's house and say with me, I will praise you. You are my life. And let it come out of your mouth. John chapter 4, the Father is seeking worshipers. This isn't a revelation. This is what God gave to Pastor Reg Lizelle. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to bring God the sacrifice of praise that God has been looking for a people in a church to praise him, to worship him with everything in him. There will be the psalmist and the songs of the Lord and the house of the Lord. The Holy Ghost will begin to move in the place as never ever before and we will be reestablished to a place of his presence once again psalms 22 4 listen to it literally god is invited in your praise he inhabits praise i'm telling you when you get a house that's praising god there will be revelation there'll be answers there'll be counsel there'll be healing There'll be deliverance. Hallelujah. It'll happen because God inhabits it. He doesn't want to go to a house that has performers and singers. He wants to go to his house that has worshipers. Then what happened under this apostle? Real prophets, real prophecy, and real laying on hands. I'm telling you, if you come under the anointing of real prophecy... And real prophets, there'll be an impartation, you listen to me, an impartation into your life that you couldn't study for, you couldn't read for, you couldn't fast for, you couldn't just go get it. It's imparted. 
impart it. Something will be different about you forever with the prophetic impartation. Next thing in the house. It's his house. This is what generals do. Missions. It's not about us, me, myself, and I. The trinity of ourselves have to die. What can we do that will please God on the earth? We are responsible for Uganda. We are responsible for Liberia. We are responsible for Israel. We're responsible for Taiwan. We're responsible. God has put, if he's really going to use a people, then the people have to say, God, whatever we can do, let's do it. And then we need to send missionaries. I believe with all my heart, God is speaking to people right now. There'll be a lot of preparation. But we're going to send missionaries out of this house, from this house, from this DNA, around the world again. Are there generals? Not as many as there should have been. Well, I'm going to close with this. I'm in a gathering. I'm in Kenya. The Holy Spirit said, go to this church and visit this pastor. I said, I'm in Kenya. I've got five children. I'm really busy. I just preached 17 times. Right when you get back, get on the airplane and go to this church. Okay, you're the king. All right. Yes. Get on a plane. I go to this church on a Wednesday night. Supernaturally, the pastor stops. There's probably 2,000 people on a Wednesday night. The pastor stops and said, I want to see you after service. We go in the back room. I'm not going to tell you his name. And God gives me a word. You can either be a brother and fight with your brothers the rest of your life, or you can become a father right now and God will give you the nation. It's your choice. You got to quit competing with your brothers. And you got to become a father and help others, and God will promote you. And he didn't do it. He's one of the greatest preachers in modern times, and he didn't do it. And he has suffered needlessly. I'm going to say this today I say it in love. God, use us together. Come on, lift your hands. Oh, God, use us. Hallelujah, use us. Say it. Use me any way you want, Jesus. Lord, I loved you as much as the custodian, as the pastor. I just love you. God, I just love your house. God, I love your people. Father, we would ask, the generals have walked through this house and the pieces are all in order touch it again come on everybody touch it again oh God move again if you've been a leader and you've been harsh and you want position right now repent if you're a pastor and you're wash, watching and you just think it's about you Repent. Just say, God, I'm so sorry. I, I haven't heard from a man of God in a long time who would tell me the truth. God, I'm sorry. I want to brag about what I'm doing. I exaggerate about myself. I, I want to be applauded. I want to be important. Just repent of it right now. If you've been in a great church, this church, and you just have attitude, repent of it right now. And just say, God, move. Oh, God, move. Hallelujah, move by your spirit once again. Hallelujah. Oh God, let the fire of heaven come once again. Hallelujah. Let the glory of the Lord come once again. Hallelujah. Let the prophetic come once again. Hallelujah. Let the peace and the joy come once again. Let heaven invade the house of God once again. Just once again. Oh Lord. Please don't let us just hear the stories. 
but let us become the story. God, let us become the story of your mighty power. And I declare over the people of God this night, the latter rain will be greater than the former rain. I declare it in the name of Jesus. What a wonderful year we've had. Hallelujah. Take us out in worship, would you please? Lord, I owe.